It is, we are at Chaminade High School. It is April 26, 2007, and we're interviewing Constantine Cookie Cucurillo, Staff Sergeant of the U.S. Army Air Force of the 2nd Bomb Squadron, 22nd Bomb Group, also known as the Red Rangers, and he was in the Southwest Pacific Area of Operations during World War II. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, now, how did you get into working for the service? I enlisted in uh, 1942. I was working on the uh, Norden bomb site, which is a very secret project, and it just it didn't. I didn't feel right just sitting there getting a deferment. So I just left there one afternoon, went down to Whitehall Street, raised my right arm, and they enlisted me in the Army. Now at that particular time, you did not enlist in the Air Force. We did not have an Air Force. The Air Corps was part of the Army. So you enlisted in the Army, and then they placed you wherever they wanted you to go. So they put me in the Air Corps, and wound up in Miami, Florida. From there, I went to uh, armament school in uh, Lowry Field in Colorado. I spent, uh, we spent six months there learning all the armament that, that goes on to a bomber. The, the guns, what we had to do was learn how to strip a caliber 50 gun, blindfold it, and put it back together. We, we learned about the turrets, and after that I was sent to Greenville, South Carolina as a uh, armament. Now I wanted to go into the flying part of this uh, of the service, but when I took my physical, I was colorblind. I took that. I don't know if you fellas ever saw that that circle, the Japanese Ishihara exam. Well, I flunked that, so they wouldn't take me in the, as a gunner. Well, while we were stationed in Greenville, I went to get my monthly shot every month they get a shot and the uh, flight officer the, asked me why I didn't uh, was not a gunner because that five foot four perfect fit for any place in it I told him I was colorblind and just like the army he said you see the calendar on the wall I said yeah he said what color are the numbers I said they're red he said you're in now, I said, but if you send me to gunnery school, what happens if they take, they, they give me a physical, they find I'm colorblind, and they'll fuck me out. Well, they said, you can't do that because we send you on what we call detached service, which means I'm sending you, see Cucurullo, train him as a gunner, and send him back to me. You don't have anything to do with him but train him as a gunner. And that's what they did. My first flight was in an open two-seater with, uh, they had a, what they called a gunner's belt, which was tied onto your parachute harness and tied right onto the, the, the body of the airplane. And then you had a regular safety belt which held you tightly in the airplane. But now, when you had to fire your guns, you had to stand up. So you took off this safety belt, and you stood up like a World War I gunner, and you fired at the tow targets, which incidentally were flown by women. The women flew the, float, uh, the tow targets, the women Air Force. That was a, a very interesting job because sometimes they would come back with bullet holes in the tail of their airplane. From there, I uh, graduated from there and came back to uh, Greenville Army Air Base and was given a two-week furlough. I came back and I, t I told my mother that I would probably be in the States for six months because that's what it takes to train. You, you get put on a crew, you get trained, and it takes about four to six months and then they send you overseas. 
Well, when I got back, there was a note on my uh, bunk. Report to the orderly room immediately. Well, I went to the, I went to the orderly room, and they said, uh, Captain Flarkstad has chosen you to replace his gunner who got sick. So I said, what does that mean? He said, you'll be flying overseas with them in about three weeks. So I flew with them what they call transition. You learn how to re uh, react with one another. And we flew, you, you fly off from Greenville, you fly to Bahamas, you fly to Nassau, you fly to Florida, and then you, you land in the evening back to Greenville. And we did that for about uh, three weeks and then we went overseas. Um, considering that your civilian job involved the work on the secret Norden bomb site, was there any concern about your falling into the en enemy's hands as a prisoner of war? Well, the problem was that unbeknownst to, this, uh, to the uh, Norden Bombsite Company, the Germans already had that bombsite. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if you have read the, a book called The House on 92nd Street. There was a movie about that. And the man was taken, he took every drawing of that Norden Bombsite. He worked where I did, in Varick Street, New York. He took every drawing of that bombsite. Each evening he'd take a page out. And he took the whole bomb site. They had it just way before we, uh, we, we excuse me, we, that we knew we, they had it. So was the level of security lower there, or was it just, they, they just infiltrated it? They just took it out. In fact, what they did was, uh, the way they found out about it, they had a five cent piece that was hollowed out, and there was a piece of microfilm in there. And, the FBI, in some way, found out somebody ratted this guy out, mm -hmm. and he found out. But that's what they knew how they did. Okay, so what was your first mission overseas? My first mission was on a B-25. Uh, that was a uh, medium bomber. I flew the top turret. We flew. Uh, uh, we flew uh, missions. Strafing missions and bombing missions to help the uh, Australian Seventh and Ninth Division. They were uh, they had they uh, they wanted to capture this uh, this little area in New Guinea, and the Japanese were uh, were camped there, and we went in and strafed and bombed them, and then they took that. It was uh, I think what they did was our first mission. They gave us an easy one. Mm. There was no flak or no fighter, so we oh. figured it was a piece of cake. Yeah. So how many people were in your crew on the, on the airplane? A six. In the B-25, there's six. Pilot, co-pilot, bombardier navigator, engineer, radio man, and armor gunner, which was me. So did you find that you guys would stick together, like the relationship between your crew is very strong, right? It, it, see, or would it switch out? Yeah, we, no. What happens on the B-25, we went over, we took our own aeroplane, so mm -hmm. we stayed together until we, uh, we made the transition from the medium bomber to the heavy bomber. When we went from the, heavy, the medium to the heavy, we needed 10 men. To miss. So then everybody got bollocks around, and but we all, when we went overseas, we all stayed in the same tent. The uh, the enlisted men stayed in the tent. Officers stayed in their own area. Yeah. So how was it? You were working with the Australians. Like, well, yes, we had. So how was it working alongside them? Or yeah, what well, Major Staley. The Australian uh, Captain uh, Major Staley, he was the uh, liaison officer, and the Australian ground crews, when they needed uh, strafing or bombing a, a particular area, they would send us. Uh, Major Staley would uh, brief us as what they wanted us to do, and we would help them out. So, in your first mission, you said was fairly easy. Have you, did you encounter anything like difficult no. after? No? No, it was just, you know, we figured, gee, it's a piece of cake. Yeah. 
but then the roof blew in. Yeah. <laughs> See, our primary, our primary duty was not the strafing of the troops, it was airfields. Mm -hmm. See what happens, the, uh, the Japanese would fly their airplanes in at night and then bomb the uh, Marines who were going into Cape Gloucester and all those places. So what we would do, early morning, we would go and bomb their airfields and try to get them while they were on the ground. So naturally when you're bombing airfields, they got airplanes there, right? right. So. Most of the problems we had was with, with aircraft. Their, their, uh, their flak wasn't that good. But, uh, we, would, uh, we would go down on medium bombing and bomb the runway and then head into a dive and dive right on and get to about 300 miles an hour with a 25 heading into a dive and getting the heck out of there and flying like treetop level back to our base. So you would only go, you'd only hit the airfield once, correct, or multiple times? Oh yeah, there would be, uh, when, the, uh, when the Marines landed at Cape Gloucester, we had, uh, we had three missions there. Mm -hmm. and an interesting situation at Cape Gloucester. Uh, the uh, gentleman who lived up the street from me was a Nassau County uh, detective, and unfortunately had uh, contracted uh, malaria, mm -hmm. um, I mean uh, cancer. And I would go and visit him every uh, Saturday and chat a while. And one day he said, you know, this is my anniversary. I said, well, how many years you married? He said, no, he says, it's my first landing as a Marine. I said, where? He said, Cape Gloucester. I said, you're a kid. <laughs> I went home, I got my uh, diary, and I showed it to him. December so and so, Cape Gloucester. He said, Why you Gloucester? He said. <laughs> he said, You were there for a couple of hours, you went home, you came back and then you went back to your tent. And now we spent six months there. <laughs> <laughs> you picked the wrong area. <laughs> but it was interesting. So in flying your missions over airfields and bombing airfields, um, the Japanese airplanes did get up in the air and oh, sure. they fired at you, correct? Yeah. yeah. So did you ever have any close calls? Well, the close calls we had we, you, were after we got out of the B-25s, we got into the heavy group. Mm -hmm. And the heavies were long missions without fighter cover. We were fortunate with the B-25s and long mission, we had fighter cover. And it was very seldom that we did encounter, uh, uh, what do you call it, overwhelming the Japanese uh, aircraft. We'd get, uh, we'd get a, a goodly number coming in, but not the massive amount that we had when we went to 24s. And we didn't have any fighter cover. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, and as I mentioned in my, my last mission, we flew to the Borneo airfield, uh, the Borneo uh, oil refinery. If you ever drive along uh, the, uh, the highway in New Jersey, mm -hmm. you see that big, uh, Oil refinery, the yeah. tanks and all that. Yeah. Well, picture that from 15,000 feet. <laughs> and uh, we, we bombed that outfit and we had uh, the fighters hit us for 45 to 55 minutes. Just constant, constant. And then what, what they had, since we didn't have cover, they had medium bombers flying on top of our bombers mm -hmm. and dropping phosphor bombs on us. Mm -hmm. Now, the bo phosphor bomb would explode and be look like a jellyfish, yeah. all the little tentacles coming out. And one of our aircraft got hit in the engine and just blew. Just a the tiny piece of uh, phosphorus would go right through the... Yeah, it's and like explode the tank. heated shrapnel, right? Yeah. So, um, so... When you're flying the larger planes, you never got any cover at all? In the shorter missions we did, but after we got the 10, 12 hours, I would say my last uh, 24 missions in a 24, probably my last, my last 10 missions we were without fighter cover. How many missions overall did you fly? Uh, 50. 50, wow. 
I flew 25 in a 25, 24 in a 24, and one in this one. And um, what were the differences in the planes that you flew? Well, of course, the, 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 the B-24 is a four-engine long range, and the B-25 a twin-engine short-range medium bomber. The, uh, the mission I flew on this one was a uh, reconnaissance mission. It's an interesting story. They, the B-17s weren't used that much in the Pacific because they didn't have the range. So, but we did have a, uh, a group that had uh, RECO missions which would fly over an area, take pictures, and then come back. Well, we flew one mission with them on this. And they called our squadron, they wanted three gunners. But they had radio, they had engineers and co-pilot, but they didn't have any gunners. So we would go in. Now, <laughs> me, Baggio, and Shorty, Shorty Taylor, <laughs> the three of us go there, I'm the tallest. <laughs> I'm five foot four, I'm the tallest. And the, the, the pilot of the 17th is, is that goddamn uh, second squad with a bunch of midgets. <laughs> so, well, we were all ball turret gunners, and we we just went in there. So, um, I was going to ask, um, so with the 17, did you find not dropping bombs and just going to take pictures a little uneasy that you're just, you know, you're just putting yourself out there to take pictures, not to actually it, it, it attack was, uh, the enemy? We, we counted that as a milk run. Yeah. We figured, okay, you know. We went to a place called Rabaul. And uh, Rabaul was the, uh, the largest and the most heavily fortified uh, position that the Japs had there. In fact, they used to call it Bloody Rabaul. It was interesting. The uh, a B-25 group went in there, and it was, uh, Rabaul was a, uh, an area that it it had a circular harbor in it, and uh, the strafe the Apaches. They had a B-25 Apache group that did most of the shipping, attacked most of the shipping. They went in there, and they got they got the heck beat out of them because when they came in, they had mountains here, mm -hmm. and flying at. Uh, what do you call it, uh, tree, uh, mast height, they couldn't raise that ship over the mountain. So they had to go in, come around, and keep coming around. So they were hit with the flak going in mm -hmm. and going out. They lost like, they, they sent like uh, 10 or 15 bombers in there, and they lost five. Mm. Right there. So I know with the Army, especially in World War II, you need to accumulate a number of points to be able to go home. So with you being in the Air Corps, how many flights or missions did you have to go on before you could receive passage home? In the Pacific, they gave us uh, 50 missions, 350 combat hours, and a year and a half overseas. You had to get a combination of the three. Okay. So and you're a sergeant, correct? You were a sergeant? A staff, yes. Staff sergeant, okay. So did you start as um, a private or an enlisted, or did you...? Well, when you're, you're enlisted, you gotta, it's a private. Right. But so that, so uh, how did you uh, rise to the level of staff, staff? sergeant? Staff? Interesting. <laughs> uh, see, staff or any rank in the Air Corps doesn't really mean the same as a, a rank in the Army, okay. because a staff sergeant in the army has a, a group of people that he's responsible for. Correct. Each one of us uh, are a specialist. And one of the big reasons why they give us a sergeant or staff is that if you were shot down in Germany, you got a different treatment as a staff sergeant than you did as a private. Okay. So all air crews were given uh, buck sergeants, which was three. Mm -hmm. Now, when we when we left, uh, when I got out of gunnery school, I got a, I got a buck sergeant, which is three strikes. Okay. And when we went overseas, my pilot, he put us in and got a staff. 
which was really good because we got, uh, I think it was $90 a month plus 20% uh, overseas and 50% on top of that for flying status. So at that particular time, I was $125 a month, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. When the, you were first drafted in the Army, you got $21 a day, once a month. Okay. Take that one out. And I also see that you have um, certain patches or awards. Or awards? Could you explain those? Yes. This is uh, the first one you got here is the uh, air medal. Okay. And each succeeding air medal you get, you got a cluster. So in all, I got four, four air medals. The middle one is the good conduct. This one right here is the Pacific Ribbon with four battle stars, which I, with four campaigns. And this is the, uh, this is the, uh, what do you call it, the Victory Medal. This is the Philippine Liberation Ribbon mm -hmm. with one battle star. And this is the New York Conspicuous Service Cross. So, with the Battle Stars, could you explain or state every campaign that you were in? Yes. Every four? But or one? You see, it's, it's, it's different in the Air Corps than it is in the Army. Yeah. They, if they, they have a certain area and they say, this is, this is a, a campaign area. So we bomb that area. And, okay. All right. Now, this is another area. You got that, okay? Give another stop. Give another stop. So, all right. Yeah. yeah, I get it. Um, so, with the Filipino uh, Liberation Medal, that was basically kind of the same thing. Yes, we had uh, we bombed Davio, and uh, incidentally, it's an interesting thing about Davio. Right off of Davio is a small island, and on that island is a beautiful building with a big dome on it, or a beautiful home, real spread out ranch and all that. And we were told that your bombing run would be directly overhead, and if anybody dropped a bomb on that, he would be, we'd be court-martial. Really? That was General MacArthur's house when he lived in the Philippines. Hmm. Okay, so, and you were the gunner, you were the top gunner, correct? The one that would stand up? Well, I was, a, I was a top gunner in the B-25. Right. Um, what caliber of weapon did you find? 50s. The Raw 50 caliber. That means that they're approximately a half inch in diameter. Um, did, did the caliber of the gun vary, vary from... No. No? Everything All the guns had 50? 50s. 50s? Yeah. The, uh, the Brits use a lot of 30 calibers. In fact, uh, there was only one 30 caliber gun in the uh, in the old B-25s, like the ones that uh, Billy Mitchell flew off the uh, the Hornet, mm -hmm. they had one thirty caliber, because when it, they had a little uh, mount that went through the plexiglass, and if you get to put a fifty in there, it'll blow the thing apart. So now, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, one more question about the fifty. Uh, how many, approximately, how many shots would it take to down an airplane? Yeah. In the ball turret, you, you got 800, 800 uh, shells, and then you can expand those in one minute. Okay. Your, the 50 caliber gun shoots 800 a minute. Now, in the nose, in the nose turret of a B-24, in this one right here, this nose turret mm -hmm. right here, right, the, the, uh, the ammunition is placed in boxes in the bombardier's compartment. So you had 500 in each gun, and it treaded through up into the turret. Now, in the last mission I was on, they took the ball turret out. So I flew in the nose turret. And they told us that you had to take 500, uh, 250 in each, rather than the 500 because of the weight. Well, being from Brooklyn, I don't buy that. I put the 500 in each, and I had an extra Canada of 250 in the bombardier's compartment, and I told him, I showed him how to hook it up if we ever needed it. Came back to that mission, I had less than 50 shots in each one. 
Now, so, what would you uh, consider your most memorable moment on an airplane during your missions? The moment when we went to Borneo and we uh, we lost uh, we lost a uh, I think we lost five airplanes out of uh, out of about thirty-five airplanes. We lost five, and uh, when uh, we were attacked, and the two airplanes were coming right, right dead center on the nose. One peeled off to hit another ship, and this one came straight at us. And I was fortunate enough to explode him. And as I mentioned to you fellas before, I got a letter from my co-pilot many years later, stating if you remember the conversation we had before we took off. Now, uh, as an aside, the missions were so long, we took off at 2 o'clock in the morning. Took off and, and then, so we could be, get back by daylight. So we're sitting out there in the revetment waiting for the, uh, incidentally, if you, if you ever get an opportunity to go into, down to the tropics in that area, you lie down on a, a runway, there's no blue sky. It's all stars. Oh, millions and billions of stars. The, you know, over here you look up, you can count the stars, right? You there? It's all stars. It's unreal. But anyway, when the letter I got from my co-pilot said uh, we had a discussion, you know, we could get shot down, we could become prisoners. I said, I don't know about you, but I'm coming back. And then he, he wrote to me, he said, when that Zero was coming in at us. I said to Bob, the pilot, I said, Cook better get him or we're dead. He said, so we're still here. He said, thanks to you. I said, okay. And thanks to Hager Blair. Incidentally, how old are you guys? 16. 16. 17? Yeah. Hager Blair was 17 years old. He was at the tail end of a B-24. In fact, there was a two 15-year-old boys who enlisted in the Navy, and one won the Navy Cross, which was the second highest that you could win. Of course, the Congressional Medal being the one. They found out he was 15 years old. They took all his ribbons away from him, took all his, uh, his pension from him, his pay and everything. It took him years for a congressman to finally get them all returned to him. So, if you were ever hit, um, what is the procedure of emergency landing, or are you basically yeah. well, in trouble if you're in, the, if you're in the nose of the plane? I mean, what do you do? Well, in the, in the, in the nose of this airplane, there's a door in this turret, in the back of the turret, it's a door. And back of the door of the turret, there's another door. Now, when we get hit, when we get fighter covered, or we go into a target, that, that back door is open so that in case we get hit, I can open the door and try to get out. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a turret gunner, you don't have any, uh, you don't have room for a parachute. There's no room. So what you have is a harness and your parachute should be right close to your turret. So when you get out, you grab the parachute and you got two rings. As an aside, I'd like you guys to come out to the American Air Power Museum. I'll take you around and show you the equipment we wore. We have the actual equipment. We have planes, World War II planes that fly. It's not a static museum, it's dynamic. Everything flies. And you clip these things on and then hopefully you fly up. Now a pilot, he sits on his parachute. And his, uh, the parachute harness is right here. So when, when he gets hit, when the plane gets hit, he drops his, puts his hands in there, and he goes flying out that front. Okay, so today they have a program called SEER Survival, Escape, Evasion, Rescue. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, did you guys receive any training as far as landing behind enemy lines if you did go down? Yeah, well, the only training you got, since we're in, uh, what do you call it, we're over, over water 90% of the time, is just how to, Brace yourself for a ditching procedure. That's about it. 
and then we had a raft. We, yeah, what do you call it? You pulled the lever and the raft came out of the aeroplane and hopefully you got on it. And then we had what we call the Gibson Girl. It was a unit that fit in between your legs and this is our electronics. You grind away like a coffee grinder and it sends out a signal. It's a signal generator, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it sends out signals to uh, the, uh, you know what a consolidated uh, uh, PV4 wire is? The, the flying boat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The flying boats are usually within a couple of hundred miles of your target. And they circle around that ocean area, wait for you to be picked up. And we also had submarines. We had a submarine in the harbor of Borneo. Wait, if the, some guys got down. So, did you ever have a fear of getting caught by the Japanese, or what would happen? Or no, no. Now, uh, you were saying before how you almost collided with the Japanese plane be in, uh, before when you were talking about your most memorable moment. Um, was that the closest you came to ever perhaps getting in a very getting bad blown up? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, we get hit with flak, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't that bad. You know, we get get holes all over the aeroplane, but we were never hit. Uh, uh, never a fatal hit, actually. The only one time that I actually got put my chute on and ready to ready to get out. In fact, I had salvoed the back door of the uh, the 24. The 24 at the back has a hatch about uh, four feet by three feet. And you, you salvo that hatch and you can get out with your parachute and all that. When we took off, the left engine started to smoke. And I called the pilot. I said, hey, Cal. I said, left engine smoke, number one engine smoking. He said, what, is it white or black? I said, it's black. I said, the first puff of white, I'm leaving. <laughs> he said, well, hang on. So I thought I saw a little gray, so I salvoed the hatch. I'm ready to go. And he said, hold it. And they feathered the prop. It was the, this engine right here. He feathered that engine. And he said that what had happened, when they had filled the uh, oil reservoir, they forgot the safety wire, the nut, and of course the vibration, although the uh, fluid went onto the uh, into the engine, onto that the uh, uh, what do you call it, the booster, and uh, it started the black smoke. White smoke is gas. Black smoke is oil. When you see white smoke, it's all over. So, why would white smoke be bad? Because uh, be white I know smoke it's gas. is gas. Gas is burning. Oh, okay, that's uh, what. I gasoline mean. is right. burning. I understand. Um, so, so with, uh, you, you keep talking about your parachute, did you have to go in training for jump school or anything like that? It's an interesting thing about the jump school. Three, three classes before us, and uh, at, uh, they decided that everybody had to learn how to get out of an airplane with a parachute. So they took the boys up, and uh, the first class that jumped, two guys forgot to open the chute, and they got killed. So they decided, we're not going to do that. Then the next year they decided that you were going to have to learn that when you come down with the parachute and when you hit the ground you got to learn how to buckle your knees and twist and roll over. So you got a 10-foot tower and the guys jumped in there. The first guy broke his ankle, the next guy broke a knee and they decided we're not going to do that anymore. So when my class got there they, we're not going to do anything. You're going to have to learn the hard way. So we never did get uh, that kind of training. But the training we did get, and it's an interesting situation. I don't know if you saw the movie uh, Memphis Belle. No. It was the dumbest thing that they ever put out. Now, as you know, when you get up, you get up to 15,000 feet, you need oxygen. Yeah. And these people were on their bombing run in Germany. On a bombing run in Germany, you're up at 30,000 feet, and you better have your mask on. And not only that, but it's like uh, 40 degrees below zero. Well, if you guys come out to the museum, we'll, we'll show you the whole nine yards. Well, the pilot takes off his mask, and he's, he's sweating, he's got the handkerchief, and then he puts it back, and he says to the co-pilot, 
go back and check the waist gun and he got hit. So the co-pilot takes his mask off. He walks back. Now the gunners are all officers. Oh, come on, will you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the whole thing was a mess. But the training that you get, besides the gunnery and all that, you go into a pressure chamber. And sitting in a pressure chamber, just like you fellas are sitting there, you're sitting there, and in front of you, each man is a medic. And on this side, the same guy, and each side, it's a medic sitting in front of you. And he pressurized this, this room to 20,000 feet. And they keep you there an hour. At 20,000 feet, they know certain things happen to your body. Mm -hmm. And you'll find some guys jumping up and screaming. Because what happens if the dentist hasn't done a good job on your cavity, on the filling, and left a tiny, tiny air hole in your cavity, it expands, right? Uh, air expands as you go up and contracts as you go down. That thing expands and there's nowhere to go but down into your nerve jaw. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole thing gets bloody. You see guys all that screaming. Up. So they take them out, bring them down, right? And you get up to 20,000 again. They keep you in another hour. If everybody's okay, then they pressurize you up to 30,000 feet for four hours. And the reason the four hours is because in Europe, you're flying, you're flying at 30,000 feet at four hours, two hours in, two hours back. Now, as you're sitting there, they ask you to do different things, write this, and do that, do this, do this, do that, do that. And then you have your mask on, of course. And then they give you a pad and they say, will you please write your name? When I say go, write your name. Okay, go. Well, my first name is Constantine, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It's okay. And you look down, I got C-O-N, that's it. What they do is when they say go, they cut your oxygen off. They want to prove to you how long it takes before you get, you, but you don't die immediately, but you, you go flat out. Yeah. Then, so you can see you're 30,000 feet, you don't have a mask on, you're dead. So, on your bombing runs, did you guys get up to 30,000 no. feet or you stayed low? No, because in the South Pacific, our bombing targets were so small mm -hmm. that we had, to, we had to see them, actually. Yeah. In Europe, how can you miss Berlin? I mean, I mean yeah. 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 Well, how can you miss any city? Uh, that's, the, that's the thing we had. 15,000 was probably what we, uh, we bombed. So that, in effect, made your job a lot more dangerous, probably. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. It made your job a lot more dangerous, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, see, the, the Japanese ACAC, they, they had 90 millimeters. And the Germans had the, the famous 88. Mm -hmm. But then, their 90 millimeters weren't as, uh, what do you call it, as sharp as the 88. They were bigger and uh, flew more flak, but they weren't that accurate. If they were that accurate, they'd have knocked us all out of the sky. Because we only had, the biggest mission we were on were like, you know, maybe 40, 50 aeroplanes. Because in the Pacific, we got, we got what was left over. Mm -hmm. Europe was number one. We had to get rid of Europe first. There were times we couldn't fly our aeroplane because we didn't have parts. Um, after the war, uh, before the war, sorry. Did, uh, what, what was your job? What did you do? I was a, I was a, a senior draftsman for the Remington Cup. And what did you do there? I was, uh, uh, the designer would come up with a, uh, a design for the uh, business machines, and then he would give us the drawings, and we would take the details off and draw the details and give it to the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the shop to make the parts. And um, after the war, did you continue? After the war, I went to, uh, well, of course, I graduated from Brooklyn Tech. And I got a job. I graduated on Friday, went to work on Monday, <laughs> and worked for 50 years. 
and was the uh, senior design engineer for Sperry Corporation. So how old were you when you entered the war? I was old. I was 21. Were you married? Or no. Any no. Did you have any uh, relationship relations in the in the army itself, like a brother, cousin? No. 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 My uh, my best friend. <clears throat> I was. Uh, I don't know. If, during the war, we got the the APO address. There was the V mail we got. The V mail was one sheet, and if there was more letters to write. They, he wrote another sheet, and it was like another letter. And I got a letter which uh, said, uh, we had a very nice wedding, and uh, we're very happy. Signed, Ann Slova. I said, who the heck is Ann Slova? And then I look at the address, it's 48 Caton Place. I said, my sister married my best friend. <laughs> I didn't even know they were going out. <laughs> and then I got the, the the first letter, and they explained that uh, they what do you call it? They married her. Yeah. Then he got shipped out, and he wound up uh, as a medic in uh, in the army. Uh, did you marry after the war? I married in 1940, uh, 1949. Did you have any children? Yes, four. Um. All college grads, all happily uh, endowed with whatever they, uh, whatever they're doing. Uh, what t what year did you get out of the war? Did you get out in forty five? Forty five. So you were there for VJ Day, right? Oh yes, yeah. Was that like? Could you explain like? Was that the happiest day of your life? Yeah. Or? Well, yeah, but well, I, it was interesting. In uh, when we would when we came back, the war was still on when we came back. I came back and I. In uh, Christmas of 1944, what happened? We were we were scheduled to fly home, but at that particular time they were flying the uh, the wounded out of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So we got on a ship, 26 days on a ship, zigzagging across the Pacific, just by our own some in a one of those Liberty ships. Nobody around, just us, and. Uh, we got home and uh, yeah, and then we got shipped to uh, Nuevo Laredo, uh, Laredo, Texas, as a gunnery instructor, because when I came back, they gave me three choices: a second tour in Europe in medium bombers, which was a death throw, mm -hmm. a second tour in B-29s in Japan, or uh, a what do you call it, a gunnery instructor? I told him I'm not going to fly anymore. I'm not flying anymore. So they put me down as an instructor, and I went to Laredo, Texas, and and then I was shipped from Texas to Florence Air Base. And in Florence Air Base, they decided that they wanted people with at least two rows of ribbons, staff sergeant and above, and they put them in the MPs. Now here's a couple of Cunningham is five foot four. I'm five four. I'm an MP, right? I walk into the city, some guy six ten, he get pound me on the head, what am I gonna do? So what they did was they put us on what they called sergeants of the guard. And you're on twenty five four hours a day and then two days off. And you go around and have an S G on here and you walk around with your Jeep. The only person that in that uh field that has a higher rank than you is the officer of the day. So after five o'clock at night, the officer of the day is in charge and you're in charge of running around and seeing that everything is okay. And Cunningham was one of these guys who every time he, he always wanted to take that gun out and shoot somebody. I mean, we didn't have the 45 then, we had the uh, 38. And one day they, I, we were just changing shifts, and they brought this fella in. He was about six four, drunk, out of this bed. And he said, to, to, "Okay, we have to sign in, put you in jail." He said, he "Said to Cunningham, you ain't big enough. 
So Cunningham draws this hog leg out, and he sticks it in his mouth. He says, how's that? He says, you're big enough. <laughs> Now, uh, throughout the war, did you grow close to any of your crew members or any of that? After? Uh, well, during, after, did you grow up? Well, after the war, we had our reunions. Yes. Did you? And we uh, had, uh, up until, uh, unfortunately, my wife is in a nursing home now. She has uh, Alzheimer's. And up until, uh, she's in there now three and a half years. And up until four years ago, we used to go to all our uh, meetings. We used to go have a uh, reunion every year in different parts of the country. Have you ever um, gone back and visited overseas? No. Were you? No. Yeah. no. There's nothing to visit in the jungles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, a question I had earlier about the two-seater that you were training on. Back I, I, when yeah, sorry. I had a question about the two-seater plane that you trained on. Yes. Um, with that gun, was that gun above the propeller or was it in line with the propeller with the, the distributor? It's uh, right here. I bought this book just for that particular reason. Uh, page, uh, excuse me. Oh, okay. So we're See, he's seated, right? Yeah. Now, when uh, when you got to fire that gun, you got to get up because you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're wondering why you don't shoot the tail off, right? Yeah. Well, on a scarf, it's called a scarf mount. The gun is on a mount like this. So when you when you get near the propeller, they got a bump on there. It's like a cam, and you when you you slide your gun, the gun automatically okay. goes over the yeah, tail. Yeah, okay. So now the first first ride they give you on this, the, the the pilot would say to you, "Have you ever you ever flown before?" Mm -hmm. Now if, if you lie and say yes, you're in deep trouble, because they say okay. Ready? Yeah. We take off and all of a sudden they turn you upside down, they barrel roll you, they they dive down, oh, they give you they give you one heck of a ride, you know? I said I never flew before. That's okay. So is it dangerous if you're standing up on strapped when you're No, but go you see what I'm down? saying, I told you the uh, <laughs> at the bottom of the aircraft is a loop. Oh, okay. That the, and the fun. loop yeah. goes around, and you got your chute on, and it's looped around here and okay. down, and you latch that on, so that, and then you stand up. So then the front gun, I suppose there's a front gun to that plane, it's controlled by, by the pilot then? No, this thing just... Uh, there's just a back... This is just one gun. gun. This is a training gun. Oh, this okay. is a training. So that's just... That's it, yeah. Training. This is okay. a training uh, uh, ship. All right. Now, in uh, your other planes, the where where would you be stationed on the on the uh, plane itself? Like uh, my my job on the plane, as I said, be, is uh, the is in one of the turrets, uh, either the turret of the uh, the uh, the front turret or the ball turret. Normally, I'm in the ball turret, which is the bottom. You're right here, right? Now, as I said before, when they took the ball turret out, then I flew in the nose, right there. That's, that's the position. Now, as, a, as the armorer gunner, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of arming the bombs. And when the plane takes off, and you go into the bomb bay, there's a small little walkway that you go through, and the bombs are hanging there, and you latch the wire, into a, uh, a unit, the wire comes through another hole in the bomb, and through the bomb into a propeller, into a safety pin. 
Now, when you take off, you put your, your wire through there, through the prop, through the hole, and you put and you take the safety pin off. So that when the the bomb drops, the wire stays hooked on here. When the bomb comes, bomb drops, the wire slides off out of the propeller. And when the propeller hits the airstream, the propeller flies off. That allows the uh, the uh, the unit there in the front to uh, the igniter to back into the bomb and explode the uh, the, uh, the what is it? I mean the uh, the bomb itself. So I have one quick question, and I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, how did you get your name, your nickname, Cookie? Well, my first name is Constantine. Mm -hmm. Now, if you lived in Red Hook in Brooklyn, nobody would call you Connie, because if they did, then you'd have to fight your way to school every day. <laughs> and since I wasn't that big that I could fight, I said, call me Cook, because Cookarolo is the second name. And in Brooklyn, you're never called a one-syllable name. It's always two-syllable. It's never Joe. It's Joe E. Yeah. John E. Frank E. Cook E. <laughs> See? That, that's where you get that. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for all your information. And uh, it's been a very good interview. Very informative. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate this. You're welcome. Uh, hope you guys watch that History Channel. Oh, yeah.